I fear your crown outshines my own. <laughs> Back in 2013, I got a chance to play the original Dragon's Dogma. It was without the Dark Reason expansion, but with Berserk inspired equipment and an epic banger playing in the main menu. Dragon's Dogma is one of its kind A RPG, which means action-packed RPG. It has a few profound mechanics and distinguishable gameplay features that moved it to the top of my favorite games. The game starts with a dragon which attacks a small village of fishermen, proving the foretellers' prophecies about the arrival of the dragon, which would burn this world to the ground and start the end of the world. Unless somebody stops it, that somebody would be an Arisen, a human whose heart is ripped out by the dragon, whereas in exchange the Arisen gets some sort of immortality. But before that transformational event, you should create your character, which is a big deal in this game. Besides solely physical appearance that changed nothing in any other game, here the height and weight you choose make a difference. It was unknown at first, but with a new game run I started noticing small differences like stamina recovery or climbing speed. It blew my mind how varied this mechanic is. For instance, when your body weight is high, you climb monsters grotesquely slow, but it's compensated with a bigger number of things you can carry before you get encumbered. Or the taller you are, the faster you run, it makes sense as your legs are longer. Whereas being a dwarf not only would make you look like Tom Cruise, but you'd climb monsters like he does cliffs. Or you would be able to enter a tiny goblin cave for extra content. It's definitely not something that flips your game upside down, but it adds depth to replayability. Or based on the length of hands, you will have to stay closer or farther from enemies to reach them. And again, it's not a game changer, but learning and knowing all of this surprises me still. And that's when gameplay shines even brighter, because even without the character creation mechanic, the game appears to be a masterpiece thanks to its crisp combat mechanics. When your intergalactic freak is created, you're ready to advance in the story. You have a choice between three basic classes. First is Fighter, a melee vacation with a sword and shield aimed at mostly protecting your companions. The next one is Strider, one of the strongest and probably overpowered classes in the game that relies on a bow and daggers, which can be used for both close quarter battle or ranged fights. His climbing speed is the fastest in the game, and oh boy, is the climbing mechanic an integral part of the game. Not only it does differentiate Dragon's Dogma from many ARPGs, but it also makes the fights gorgeous and sought after. You just can't resist that feeling of domination. If you don't prefer to lick monsters' balls while climbing, your choice will be Mage, a spellcaster who mostly assists and heals his teammates. But I'll be honest, this vacation feels the lamest. Yet there is an advanced class of Mage, Sorcerer. This guy can melt worlds single-handedly. His abilities are aimed at dealing as much damage as possible, creating tornadoes, meteorite showers, or ice spikes, or take Magic Archer, an advanced class that combines Strider and Mage. He wields daggers and a magic bow that, among other things, can cast numerous thunder ricochets, which can obliterate enemies in closed space. It's one of my most used classes due to its adaptability. Not each vocation is so versatile. They all have their own strengths and weaknesses. Some of them are loved by the community, and some of them lag behind. But one fact remains. Combat feels superb, and that's when the game really shines like a diamond. Thanks to Itsuno Hideaki, who worked on Devil May Cry 3, 4, 5 and, well, 2. Yes, that monstrosity. But in his defense, he was assigned somewhere in the process of development to try to save the game. Alas, we know how it turned out at the end. However, he insisted on working on Devil May Cry 3. His passion and view later turned out to be a pivotal point, saving the franchise and fans' hearts. Capcom trusting in Itsuno's vision allowed him to test the waters and develop a game he had been dreaming of for ages. Dragon's Dogma. By looking at the combat system in the game, even for a minute you can tell it's his brainchild. And that's what I have always been dreaming of. Open world RPG with the combat system of Devil May Cry. Just look at these trademark moves. Another vacation I can't miss out is Fighter's Advanced Vacation. Warrior. 
a huge nod to the Berserk manga. You can pick up an enormous piece of steel and go to crush skulls, which sounds neat, but wait until you meet specters, which don't care how much physical damage you have. They are weak to magic and magic only. And it can be a too late realization when you figure out your build was wrong and you need to make your way back to the vacation master. So it comes down to whether you will spend one minute fighting a monster or an eternity when your game might feel like a monster hunter session, unless you can kill the monster at all. Take a look at a metal golem. It's susceptible to physical damage only, which means taking that golem down being a solo sorcerer is almost an impossible task to accomplish. That's when your companions or pawns step in. Itsuno always loved to play online games with his friends. Well, who doesn't? But the experience might feel frustrating at times, especially when you'd require to have friends first and then gather with them at a specific time. It might happen you'd need to leave your team to use the bathroom during a session or answer an important call. So he wanted to create a game where you would be able to have friends available at any time. That's why he came up with the idea of pawns, immortal otherworldly AI companions that have neither volition nor needs without a reason. They come from the rift, which is an interdimensional hub where they exist. The lower levels they have, the more inexperienced they are. It means low level pawns make more mistakes and die more often too. Fortunately, they can't die forever. They just return to the rift if you can't revive them. Especially good pawns can be added to your favorite list and summoned later for specific battles. Additionally, every reason is accompanied by their own personal pawn, who will stay with you no matter how many times they get eliminated by monsters or by your own hand. You choose their look and class and everything they can. They are a kind of babies, you tell them what to do. I mean, you can set up their inclinations so they act according to their class or your playstyle. They can communicate arrogantly or softly, whatever you like it, fight aggressively or defensively. As well as with parenting, it's another profound mechanic which I couldn't fully grasp how it works. Like if you give them commands, their inclinations get cancelled and don't work properly anymore. Or let's imagine you made your pawn aggressive and you expect them to be on the front lines while you cast spells. Well, forget about it, they will stand nearby and hardly ever attack. It isn't always like that, but I don't understand what triggers their behavior shift besides giving commands. So overall I found it so time consuming and too vague to understand that later I gave up on it. However, what I should give credit for is that while they are helping you, they simultaneously learn tactics against monsters, which makes them more efficient in fights when they level up. They basically grow up with you. You can also teach them through educational scrolls on monster weaknesses, which can come in handy to other players online. I should clarify that you can't play online with other real players, only your personal pawn can. I mean when you switch online, other players can find your pawn in their world or in the rift. If they find them useful, your pawn will be copied to their world and exist in parallel worlds simultaneously. In return, you get rift crystals to buy extra rare items in shops. And also other players can raid your pawn and give them some items like rotten fish as a thank you gift. So you realize your companion sucks. Story of my life, by the way. As you understand, each player has a personal pawn, which in my opinion leads to one more complication connected with save files. In Dragon's Dogma there can be only one save file, which means you can have only one playthrough at a time. So if your saved files get corrupted, say goodbye to all the progress you've made so far, because you will have to start everything from scratch. Never happened to me though. It also means once you choose the physical appearance of your character, it can be changed, unless you start a new game plus or buy a special item for altering your appearance, which can be used only one time per playthrough. So personal pawns go hand in hand with you throughout the whole journey. It goes without saying they can't be compared to real friends. Of course, unless your friends are dumb as bricks, but at least with them, you never feel feel lonely, because they can't stop chatter even for a second, or how else would you learn 20 times in a row that wolves hunt in packs? Thank our god Mr. Itsuno, you can disable their ability to speak in the game settings. However, if I speak about battles again, they can be surprisingly helpful, or they can give you handy advice about the quest you can't puzzle out. Because quests in Dragon's Dogma can be extremely confusing, which I sort of started to appreciate with time. Let me explain what I mean. It is not Skyrim with better gameplay. Dragon's Dogma has its own unique identity and the developers double down on the action. Whereas quests and variety of choices story-wise are not the main aspects 
of the game. However, I need to explain why it is what it is. Even though it was Itsuno's dream project, the game faced budget cuts, and in the final version of the game we can only see 30 or 40% of the initial plan Itsuno had in mind. For instance, that's why there is no moon in the sky at night, because it was a high level dungeon where we could travel, but in the end it was cut out. Hence, going through quests, you can definitely feel something is missing here and there. The world feels empty at times and some quest lines abrupt midway. Take as an example Kina, the girl who found and brought the protagonist home at the start of the game. She was trying to save lives after the dragon attacked, yet she felt not useful enough and eventually turned to herbology. But you would have never learned that if you hadn't listened to that random guy who stops you on your way and questions about Kina's whereabouts. If you ignored his request, not only would you lose Kina's quests, but the storyline with a witch who is living alone in the forest, struggling to fathom her part in this world, which later turns out to be a major plot detail, which consequently explains nature of the reason and pawns. You get to know none of that because you didn't pay enough attention. But what I hated at first, I started to appreciate later. Those minor missteps urge you to start the second, third and next playthroughs to find as many secrets as you missed the previous time and to finish as many quests as you possibly can. Arguably, it spices up replayability. What I started to love as well is that the game oftentimes doesn't tell you how or where you can complete or find certain quests. You need to be curious and most importantly, listen to your pawns. Interesting fact, if you play as a female protagonist, you'll get a chance to take a quest from the camp of only women bandits, because they are somewhat hostile to men. Surprisingly, I figured that out only years and years later. So when you learn something on your own, it gives you an immense feeling of adventure and later after learning about secret quests or even completing them without guides grants you real satisfaction. I did and do welcome such an approach. Nothing spoils fun more than mindlessly following guides or marks on your map until the next quest phase. I understand overcomplication of quests is not for everybody, but it doesn't have to be. There must be a choice. Some games are designed for hardcore players who are looking for adventure and secrets, and others are for those who just want to relax after a hard work day. I personally belong to both camps, depending on my day. Anyway, if the side quests didn't suit everybody's taste, how about the main plot? Beware, spoilers ahead. After the dragon called Grigori attacked, he left not only destructions, but also our lovely Arisen without his heart. While turmoil is rolling out all over the realm, Duke's men start the worm hunt, as they call themselves. A group of anybody who can hold a sword and is ready to slay the dragon. Arisen starts hearing Grigori's voice, it commands to challenge the dragon. The chosen one joins the worm hunt in a near encampment. That's when Salvation, a deadly cult of necromancers, which has been waiting for the end of the world, strikes the encampment to show power and attract attract more and more followers, because when the end comes, they will rise. With the help of spells, they take control of monsters and make them attack nearest settlements. A reason shows that he is worth something and Sir Mercedes invites him to Grand Soren, the capital of Grancis, where the Duke Edmund Dragonsbane is waiting for our arrival. Grand Soren is a huge city where you can buy and sell stuff, change vocations, complete missions or simply jump on roofs, having fun looking for secrets. And I love it. I mean secrets and dragon's dogma can't go separately. The game is saturated with them in very surprising locations at times. That's the aspect I couldn't omit. After Reason completes a few errands, he proves his loyalty and the Duke invites him to his castle. Inside no pawns are allowed and once you decide to show who the daddy is, you will be thrown into the dungeon where you have two ways out, pay a bribe or escape through the back door. In any way, you will be officially invited to the worm hunt by the Duke himself. After that starts a Reason's duty, where he mostly runs back and forth, killing and spying on Salvation. Sooner or later, the Duke will ask to get rid of their former court magician, Salomat. He is a traitor, but he is not as interesting as his magical ring. It boosts the speed of casting spells, and I need it for survival. Whereas the Duke needs this ring to brag how cool he is. So we face dilemma. If I want to keep this ring, and I pretty much do, I won't progress through the story. If I give it away, I won't be able to show off my power which lowers my ego, which will lead Lead to deleting this game. Therefore, both options lead to nothing. What should I do? That's where I get introduced to the last but not the least outstanding mechanic. 
forgery. One sweet guy is operating in the maze of streets. For your money, he'd be able to forge anything you desire. Except weapons and armor. But don't mention that to lower his income. What for, you ask? Well, let's imagine you really need that rare agate to upgrade your sword. But you can't find any around. Well, if you have enough gold, this guy will forge these materials for you and you can go to even more dangerous areas. Or if you want to fool the duke and get his magical ring to progress the story, this guy will help you. However, be careful, not all magical items items have the same properties as original ones. Like if you forge a fairy stone, a stone which is normally used to teleport around the world, this will happen. As you see, this game is rich in mechanics, which will make your playthroughs engaging. I get back to the castle to complete yet another request. On one of those missions you get lucky to meet the Dragon Forged, another reason who fought with the dragon, but lost when his weapon got broken. Anyway, he kept fighting with his bare hands. You can see how badly they are burned. In the end he lived, left the dragon's den and began his journey of teaching new reasons how to fight the dragon. He has many things to teach. Alas, he teaches my pawns how to fight the dragon only. And and then gives a reason a decent vest to lighten his sufferings. From his history class I understand that the dragon has existed long before the protagonist was born, and there can be different reasons in one world, such as Daemon, the main boss of the DLC Dark Arisen. This guy was an Arisen once, but he made a few wrong choices and corrupted himself and all other beings on the island. By the way, the death you can see flying around is also a former Arisen. Those guys and everything you see on this island are a menace. If you feel like you are ready to fight two drakes simultaneously, experience the magical maelstrom on yourself, fight the death in complete darkness, or if you want to obtain the best loot in the game, this place is for you. So you stay here, but I'll go back to the castle. Day by day on the duke's service, Arisen learns that Edmund is suffering from an ailment that drives him crazy, which turns into a disaster one night. Some time ago at the first entrance to the castle, the Duchess Eleanor had set her eyes on the stranger. She immediately fell in love and wanted to see Arisen in her chamber in the dead of night. No man could resist such a temptation for long, and hiding from guards, I finally entered her chamber one night. Before the fun even starts, Edmund Dragonsbane enters her room. The Duke is completely delirious this time, and his personal jester is as pervert as always. Suddenly, Edmund is trying to choke the princess, calling her Lenore. The Duchess is struggling to fight off her crazy husband, and I've got two choices, to leave her to die, or save her exposing our affair. I choose the second option, and step in. And of course, the Duke Duke immediately comes to his senses. Out of the blue, Eleanor's affection turns on a dime and she blames a reason for trying to pick her up. However, she had her reasons to do so. Considering Edmund's temper, they both got away relatively clean. A reason is getting whipped in the dungeon and after she begs for a reason's mercy, she gets sent to the elite prison for princesses. Chivalry has always been in my blood, so as an altruistic gentleman, I decided to save her life, in exchange for a forbidden fruit though. After 20 seconds of lovemaking, they go out Side where her people are already waiting for her. She promises to remember a reason until the end and then escapes to her homeland, away from ravaging dragons and insane dukes. It doesn't really make any difference because a reason keeps his rank and everybody seems to forget his misdemeanor. Who knows, maybe the duke is cheated on every other week. I mean, you can't execute a reason and 84% of male part of the kingdom, right? Salvation is getting more and more traction, even though a reason is trying his best to stop them. This time they've kept captured one of Edmund's fortresses. They summoned monsters to keep guard. Moreover, they've been turning anybody they meet into zombies or skeletons. As the strongest warrior around who never asks questions or anything at all, because a reason is as mute as Garden Freeman, he has to save the day and all the Duke's people. Upon arrival, for a brief minute we get to know the leader of the cult, Elysian. In fact, they've been worshipping the dragon and are ready to sacrifice their lives to speed up the process of Doomsday. Alas, they are part in all of that is just a part in a vacuum. They change nothing. A reason proves it to him first and then Grigori himself. This is absolute truth! This is salvation! Grigori is ready to accept the final battle as a reason has got stronger. He breaks down floors to open a secret passage to the dragon slayer. The passage leads to a choice between a reason's valor and cowardice. Grigori kidnapped a reason's beloved. It can be any character in the game you showed the most affection to, gave presents or completed their quests. Then you are faced with the choice to save the person a reason loves the most and accept the fight, or flee, replace Edmund Dragonsbane as the new slayer of the dragon at the price of one little life. 
Remember when Edmund Dragon's Bane was screaming the name Lenore? Well, he was shocking his wife Eleanor. Well, I suppose now you understand what choice he made. The throne and immortality instead of fighting for his beloved's life. As he's no reason to, he will punish himself for that for eternity. I don't wanna be a grieving king. I want to slay monsters for fun. So I attack Grigori and he goes nuts. After the jet lag, I see that Grigori's heart has been exposed and he can finally be slain. By the way, according to the lore, only a reasons can kill dragons. I mean, they can be harmed by any weapon, but the final blow must be wielded by an reason. otherwise it's unkillable. You might think that when the dragon is gone, everybody will live happily ever after, right? Well, wrong game. Hell on Earth literally comes down on people's heads. First of all, the sky turns green and red at night. Then all the reason whose hearts have been claimed by Grigori reach their real age. For for example, Edmund Dragonsbane turns about 100, while Dragonforge turns to dust. Grand Soren is ruined by a big hole in the center, whereas people and their houses perish in that hellish hole. And new monsters arise from the depths. Monsters you knew get corrupted and more fearsome. From now on there are huge undead warriors stalking roads day and night. Hellhounds are spitting fire like it's a never-ending fireworks show. Everything turns into a fever dream. And I can't even complain, I've asked for that. The first time when it happened, my mind was was blown, it was so awesome. Your game literally becomes a horror adventure. Have you ever asked yourself, what if your typical homicidal almighty villain won? That's what would have happened. But there is still a way to end all of this. A reason gets back to Grand Soren, probably the last pillar of security, and guards demand him to see the Duke. The Duke figured out what's what, and he doesn't like the idea of losing his throne as well as his immortality, so he immediately attacks a reason. Well, beating an old man looks inhumane, but come on, it's the Dark Ages, there is no humanity anymore, so Reason punches him like the Duke owes him his pension. When the old man is done, guards break in and the Duke blames a Reason that he cursed the land, touched him in inappropriate places and that he made a pact with a dragon to curse the land. Well, he is not wrong, but a Reason is not at fault. Being trapped, a Reason leaps from the balcony and runs for his life. The knights are following his every step, choosing between infinitely spawning guards, bleeding out from stabbing or jumping in the chasm, he picks the last one. This hole is the Everfall and it's looped. It means you can't fall to your death, but you can stop it if you cling to one of many edges. Each piece of ground has an entrance to a mini dungeon where you can collect post-game items, fight the corrupted your dragon to get legendary items or find wake stones, the heart-shaped artifact that can revive anybody who died recently. According to a pawn that is stuck there, a reason needs 20 wake stones to open a portal and break this vicious cycle. The portal leads to another dimension above all else. It leads to a local demigod. Seneschal, who wants to see proof of whether a reason was truly baptized by fire and he challenged him to fight. If you lose, you'll be reborn as the next dragon, which will corrupt the next dimension. However, if you win, he will lead the protagonist to another challenge, where he will face another choice. Go back and live happily ever after with your beloved in a world without the dragon, but a world which is just a peaceful illusion. Or a reason can choose to refuse their past regrets and good deeds to face the truth. If you do, you will see who is hiding behind that angelic attire. In fact, it's a previous reason, or rather your previous character you finished the game with. He explains that he is some sort of a god that absorbs what happens in the world and he can decide who lives or who dies. But all of that is just an empty noise, as it doesn't bring any kind of satisfaction, just eternal longing for something else. He asks to finish him off and put an end to his miserable existence, to replace him on the throne of gods, which I kindly oblige to. What's next then? A reason has been reborn into a god, you can travel your little village and do some minor mischiefs. 
and that's all. The first time I came to this place I thought to myself and that's it? The end? I shut down my console and went outside absolutely emptied. All of this was for nothing? Well apparently I refused to give up. Launched the game again and found a sword called the God's Bane. When used, a reason holds the sword in front of their heart with two options. Put it away or penetrate the heart. Either way, you have nothing to lose. So I picked the second choice. And then this happened. A reason sacrifices his soul, leaving his body as a husk for another soul, for your personal pawn. Those two become one, which means you grant your pawn their human life, soul and mortality. They become a human, which each pawn has been waiting for ages. Your beloved one immediately understands that something is wrong, yet they don't care and are ready to stay with the reborn protagonist until the end. With the price of a reason's life, the world is free from corruption and the dragon, but somewhere in another reality, another reason is born. It ends the story of Dragon's Dogma. After I found the real ending, I was flabbergasted like never before. To this day, I find such an enigmatic culmination extremely poetic and even romantic. Unknowingly, a reason gives a life to a soulless, emotionless pawn, therefore giving them true experience of love, hate and feelings. At the same time, it's a distressing story about the looped reality, that nothing the next protagonist does will change the nature of things, no matter how hard they try. They are bound to run in this endless circle of tragic losses, pawns thrown off cliffs, depression immortality and lust for power. When I saw Dragon's Dogma 2 is in development, I couldn't believe my eyes and that's how I felt. I did my waiting! 12 years of it! Does it have any connection to the first game though? The answer is yes and no. The stories are not connected, but these two games take place in the same universe with the same basis. There are dragons, pawns and their reason. However, the second game is a parallel reality with a brand new story. So if you watch the video, you would learn the ropes already and it would be enough to understand the concept of the world and no, you don't have to play the first game to start the second one. Dragon's Dogma 2 is a standalone game. I do hope they give that universe new features and realize their previous ideas which didn't see the light of day in the first game. Tell me what you think about the game and the endings and subscribe to my channel if you liked the video. Thanks a lot for watching and see you soon!